Deuteronomy chapter 30. And there was a spot in there in particular that I liked the most. We said it in a bit of a different way. Eugene Peterson, in his, his paraphrase, the message, um, kind of rephrased some of this for us. And here, Kimmy had read it for us, but I want you to hear these words again. Then I'm going to read them out of my ESV, a translation, and, and I want you to get these words as we, as we move into our study today. Here, here's what it says. This commandment that I'm commanding you today is not too much for you. It's not out of your reach. It's not high on a mountain. You don't have to get mountaineers to climb the peak and bring it down to your level and explain it before you can live it. And it's not across the ocean. You don't have to send sailors out to get it, to bring it back, and then explain it to you before you can live it. No, the word is right here and now. As near as the tongue in your mouth, as near as the heart in your chest, and then the words, just do it. That was a shout out to Nike. Here's, isn't that, isn't that good? Here's how this reads in the ESV. And maybe these words will be f more familiar to you. Um, sometimes it's good to hear it said a little bit different because it, it resonates in our hearts differently. But here's how it reads out of this translation. It says, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. And then later in this chapter, uh, Moses is speaking to the Israelites right before they entered the land of promise. And he says, I have set before you today blessings and curses, life and death. And he says, choose. He, he says, you have a choice. Um, and, and he says, and I, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today that I've set before you these options, life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, he says, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life, he is your length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. Such a good word. It seems an odd way, though, to begin or to continue our study in the book of Romans, doesn't it? And here this week, as I was studying Romans, as always, Romans is hard, isn't it? Have you ever just tried to read through it? It's hard. And, and it's hard enough that it seems like even in the church setting, we leave Romans to the experts. Let the professional theologians, let the book writers, let the professional speakers handle Romans. We, we, we don't want to touch it too much because it's difficult. And there's problems with that. Here's the first problem, and it's one of my favorite quotes from one of my least favorite people of all times. Um, I won't tell you who that is, because then you think I, I've, I've got heart issues to work through. Um, but, but he made the comment once, he says, uh, never get your religion from someone who makes their profession in talking. <laughs> like a preacher. That's kind of who he was talking about. He was talking about preachers. And, and often we leave the book of Romans to the talkers to the thinkers, to the theologians, to the professionals. And, and so it's a problem when we, when we do that because what we're doing is we're separating the word of God from the people. And the word of God was never meant to be a thing that is elite. Here's the second thing is that when Paul wrote it, the second problem with that is that when Paul wrote it, he didn't write it to professional theologians. He didn't write it to uh, the academia of the day. He didn't write it to, uh, to the, uh, the philosophers and the high thinkers, the ivory tower kind of folks. He wrote it to the church. It belongs to the church. And, and, and when, we, when we take this book in particular along with other books and we separate it from the people, then what we're doing is we're saying, you can't really handle this the right way, so we're going to take it out of your hands. And I believe the Spirit of God works big, is much bigger than that. 
and works more profoundly in our life. And so here's, here's how we come to this book, but we also come to it with the knowledge that it is difficult. Words are hard. Paul uses hard words throughout here. Now, they're hard to us, but some of the reason they're difficult to us is because for the most part, looking around, I don't know this for, for certain, but for the most part, we don't speak Greek. So, you know, that's why we say, well, it's Greek to me. Um, so, so when we come to this, what we're doing is we're reading a translation. And anytime something is translated, it's being interpreted for you. You understand that? We get in these fits about different translations, KJV, ESV, NIV, should you read the message, right? It's just a paraphrase. It's not a translation. NASB, NRSV, um, the CEV, we can go on down the list with all these uh, acronyms and initials and we get into these fights about these translations and what, the reason we get into these fights about these translations is because we know anytime someone is taking a language that we don't speak and putting it into a language that we do, they're having to take interpretive license. And so we have to entrust, we have to trust interpreters at some point. And so now what we're doing is we're reading this book through the lens of an interpreter, but we're also having to read it through the lens of needing to interpret something that is 2,000 years old. So we have this, this cultural divide as well. So when Paul was writing this, some of these things that may be difficult to us to understand probably were not as difficult. However, even Peter in his epistle, he wrote a couple letters, but even Peter made the comment at, at one point that the things that Paul writes are difficult things. Right, So even Peter sometimes got a little frustrated with Paul. Um, and I think where Peter got frustrated with Paul was in specifically, this is editorial, but specifically in Galatians 5.12, when uh, Paul says, I wish those agitators would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Um, I think Peter says, yeah, Paul even says some hard things. Right, That's, that's a difficult saying, um, but it's in the Bible so I can say it. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but we have all of these lenses. So now when we come to Romans, we've got a big task at hand, but it's a task we can do it. We can do, as it says in Deuteronomy 30, the word is close to you. It's, it, it's as close as your, the tongue in your mouth. It's as close as the, the heart in your chest. It is close to you. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. And so we come to this text with that in mind. Now, the other reason we read Deuteronomy chapter 30, or bits and pieces of it, is because some of Paul's audience was a Jewish audience. Paul himself was a Pharisee coming from a Jewish kind of upbringing, a, a Jewish training. He knew the law. He understood the law. And so he's writing, and, he, in, and in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's writing specifically about the nation of Israel and where God has a plan for this people, and that when God has a plan for a people, he will never forsake his plan, even when his people forsake him. God will never forsake his plan. And so this is kind of what this is about. And so he's reminding not only his Gentile audience, but he's reminding his Jewish audience as well that they have a part in this. I say all of that because I want you to keep in mind those words of Deuteronomy 30 because Paul quotes them in, or in Romans chapter 10. So I want to read Romans chapter 10 and I want you to hear these words from Deuteronomy but then hear them how Paul is using them. So here's the interpretive leap now that we've got. Let's work backwards, right? We're starting in the 21st century and we've got to work through the interpreters right, who are helping us work through 2,000 years of history, um, who are helping us work through the Greek language as well. And now Paul, we're reading Paul, who is familiar with the Hebrew text, the Old Testament text, who's interpreting it into Greek because he's writing this in Greek. So he takes an Old Testament Hebrew text and he translates it into Greek. So now he's interpreting the Hebrew 
into Greek, so we're, we're down here now. Plus, he's adding an interpretation of it as it relates to his immediate context. So we have this huge spectrum we've got to navigate today, and it's a big job. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to engage your brains. I sure hope you brought them with you today. Um, some, some of you, a surprising number of you just shook your head no. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if the number is surprising or the people that shook their head no, but, um, uh, but we're, we're going we're to engage your brains, and I will try to keep it as non-convoluted as possible. But then, towards the end of it, we're going to simplify everything with an analogy. And for that analogy, I'm going to need the kids' help. And so I'm warning you now, it involves tug-of-war. So, um, so anyway, um, and that will be later. So, so we're going to read this passage, then we're going to work through some of these words. Remember, we're dealing with a lot of interpretation. So here's the passage. It, it comes from Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to begin with verse 5. I am reading from the ESV. For those of you that are King James only, there is a great church down the street. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm sure it's a great church, but I'm not going to die on that hill is all I'm saying. Um, uh, so uh, whatever translation you're reading in today, um, you can follow along with me. Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into the heaven? Do you, do you remember Deuteronomy 30? He's quoting it right now. But he's interpreting it. So it's not exactly the same, but, he, but you'll see it there. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? For that is to bring Christ down. Now he's adding his own interpretation to it. Oh, isn't this hard? Um, and then he continues, or who will descend into the abyss? Now, uh, Deuteronomy talked about the sea. But in the Hebrew mind, the deep sea and the abyss of undoing chaos and, 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 and all of the things that go with death and, and not being belong to the sea. So he's making this jump and he calls it the abyss. But, but what does it say? Oh, excuse me, let me back up. Who will descend into the abyss? For that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let me read that again. For if you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not, will not be put to shame. Well, let me pause here for a second because this, this text is so rich do you remember the central theme that, that Paul has built everything in the book of Romans around is all the way back in chapter 1, verse 16. Remember what he says? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the salvation of all who believe. So he's talking about belief, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But listen, I am not ashamed. And now here he's addressing both the Jews and the Gentiles and he's talking about not being ashamed. Here's what he's, he's tying this theme together again. For with, one, for with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone, everyone, say everyone. everyone. Do you mean everyone? everyone? Because God means everyone. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that good news? This is why he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. This is good news. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, let's get into the weeds a little bit. Because there's some words in here that he uses that we think we know what it means. 
And I think sometimes the way that we've used the, wo- the words are different than the way that Paul has used the words. Uh, this passage begins with this, uh, this, uh, this phrase or this concept of righteousness. Verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. And then the next verse, but the righteous based on faith says, and then he continues. And, and so there's, there's this, this concept of righteousness. Now, here's how we tend to think of righteousness. We tend to think of righteousness as a morality, right? You do righteous things. It's good to be righteous. Um, I was thinking this morning, early this morning, of of the righteous brothers, which has no bearing on the message. Um, Regardless, you've lost that love and feeling is an awesome song. but, uh, and the original, right? But the Righteous Brothers original. Uh, but but, but this, word, this word righteous, we tend to think it just means morality. Do good things, don't do bad things. And that's simple. Except we see sometimes that morality actually gets in the way of righteousness. I've said often, sometimes we would rather be right than righteous. You ever seen that? Sometimes we would rather, we'd rather be the one in the right than to be righteous. Now, when I say that, this changes the definition of what righteousness is because righteousness as a simple morality, just doing the good things, not doing the bad things, is not something that we can attain to. Read the Bible. Have you tried? Right? You've made your resolutions. You've, you've thought it through. You, you're sick of saying that thing, right? And it, it, it just keeps happening and you're, you're like, I'm never going to do that again. You try, start trying to cram words back in your mouth. That is my Monday, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm like, why did I say that on Sunday? And so Monday, I'm always wishing I could put words back in my mouth. Quit nodding your head yes. Um, uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, you, you do that. And, and, and we find this constantly, that a righteousness that is a pure morality, we, we fail at constantly, constantly. And in fact, sometimes our morality actually hinders true righteousness. Hence, we'd rather be right than righteous. Get on Facebook, start talking politics, start talking COVID-19, start talking anything that is divisive, which right now in the world is everything, right? Everything is divisive. Everything is divisive. And, and we see this. And so we back away into our corners and we prove our cases. And, and the more we prove our cases, we, we push ourselves away from the other. The other is absolutely wrong because we're absolutely right. And the more right we become, the more wrong they become. And we would rather be right than righteous because righteousness demands a relationship. And here's where the change of how we understand the word righteousness. This will change how you read scripture, okay? This is gonna change how you read scripture because some of us, when we read the word righteousness, we think simple morality. Just do it, just do it, just do it. And there's gotta be more to it because we can't ever do it. But here's what righteousness is really about. Righteousness is really about relationship. It's really about relationship. You see, he starts off in verse 5 and he talks about this. He says, for Moses, remember Deuteronomy 30, Moses is preaching a sermon. Deutero, nomos, those two words together. Deuteronomy, deutero, means two. Well, if I hold up, that means lots of peace or victory uh, or I'm not a crook or something else. Um, Right, so that'd be four, but there's actually two. Deutero means two and nomos means words. Moses essentially preached two sermons back to back. (laughs) I thought about it just to prove a point, but I I figured it would go over like a lead balloon. Um, But Moses is preaching, and so here's what Paul says. He says, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. We're going to call the righteousness based on the law, do the right thing, don't do the wrong thing. We're going to call that a contractual righteousness. Does that make sense? A contract. Contract protects the individual's rights. My rights, your rights. You do your part, you do your part, 
everybody will be right, right? And it's a moral thing. It has nothing to do with relationship. It's all about doing or not doing, doing the right thing, not doing the wrong thing. And the law functions this way sometimes. 613 commandments in the Old Testament, do the right thing. Just do the law. Just keep the law. What's the problem? Just keep the law. Well, I got lost somewhere at 314. You know, just, we'll just keep the law. And, and so he starts off there and he talks about this contractual kind of righteousness, a righteousness based on the law. But um, we see something different in verse six. He says, but, and, and if you've been around it any time, any length of time, you know, for me, the word but means what? Disregard everything I've just said. Um, and so we come to this and there's kind of, a really big but in this passage. I'll try not to use any hand motions. There's, right? There, there's, a, there's, there's a big one here, and it says, but the righteousness based on faith says something different. So here's a different kind of righteousness. Righteousness based on faith. The first one was a righteousness based on the law. It's a contractual agreement. The second one is a righteousness based on faith, and it's a covenantal agreement. Do you understand the difference between a contract and a covenant? A contract is a prenup, a prenuptial agreement. A covenant is a marriage. See, one is about preserving individual rights, protecting yourself. The other is about protecting the relationship at almost all costs. Does that make sense? Uh, so here's righteousness that's about relationship, not just about simple morality. In fact, the first time this word shows up in Scripture, first time, is in Genesis 15, verse 6. Here's what's happened. Abraham. Remember Abraham? He's been called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. God has spoken to him, and Abraham responded. And, 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 and God had told him he's going to have offspring as numerous as the stars in the, in the sky and sand on the beach. And, uh, and, and, and Abraham and God are kind of having this conversation. God's about to establish a covenant with him, a split animals and blood. Um, it was called a, coven, a cutting covenant. And, and he's about to establish his covenant with him. And again, Abraham is kind of lamenting. And he says, the only heir I have, you've promised this, God, but the only heir I have is the, the son of my servant, Eliezer. And, and God says, no, that's not your heir. Someone of your own blood your own offspring, your own seed, will inherit. And he takes them out and again shows them the stars, shows them the sand, and he says this. And, and here's where the word righteousness first appears. And it, sa it says, Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. Did what? God credit it to him as morality? Look at the rest of Abraham's life, right? He had one too many wives, and now I have to take my shoes off in the airport. Right? <laughs> that's how, that's history in less than a sentence. Um, that's how it worked. Ishmael and Isaac, and they're still at it. Um, and so now that's, that's what went down, right? Did Abraham keep the moral covenant? No, he didn't. That wasn't what God was establishing. He was establishing a relationship. And this is where righteousness lives. It lives in the relationship. It lives in the covenant. And, and it goes out of its way. Rather than protecting self-interest, it does what is best for the other. It does what is best for the relationship. Now, it doesn't, it's not permissive of all things because all things being permissible in a marriage is not a good thing, is it? Right? You protect your marriages. You protect your relationships by saying some things are not permissible. With this ring that I'm not wearing, I the wed, right? With this ring, I the marry, I, with this ring, I, 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 I the wed as a pledge of my faithfulness and constant fidelity. There are certain things I do not do, but it's not to protect my rights, it's to protect the relationship. See, when we start with morality, it just becomes a contract. Everyone's protected and the contract fails and everyone falls apart. But when it starts with, when righteousness starts with relationship, 
then all of a sudden morality becomes the thing that binds us together. We do what we do because it binds the unity of the one with the other. This is what God is doing. So whenever you read the word righteousness in scripture, especially in Paul, Peter may use it a little different sometimes and James is his own guy, um, as is John, right? But, but especially when you're reading uh, righteousness in Paul, here's what I want you to think. Covenant faithfulness. God's covenant faithfulness. That, that changes it. So listen, for Moses writes about the righteousness, a, a morality that's based on the law, a contract based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the covenant faithfulness based on faith says something different. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven and on and on. See, it changes the context. And so we need to understand what righteousness is. That's why I can say so often we would rather be right than righteous because we can quantify right. But the second we start quantifying righteous, we have to look at the relationships around us. And so here's the first question I want to ask. Is righteousness that way should be evidenced in the relationships all around you and the relationship with God? Do you have a righteousness that is from Christ by faith? It's a hard question, isn't it? I know. I love verbal sparring. And I love being right. Quit laughing. But, 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 but really, who wants to be wrong? I've heard Mike Brinsfield say this. He, he's like, I, uh, someone once commented to him that, you know, well, you, you, you like to be right. And he says, well, I didn't get up this morning saying, well, today I want to be wrong. Well, no one ever says that. I don't want to be wrong, but I love being right. Hey, we like being right. But sometimes our rightness takes the place of our righteousness. And God's calling us to something different. And this is, why, uh, this is why he says the things that he says um, with, uh, with uh, the ascension and the, uh, the, declish, the, the descension into hell. Here's why he says this, because notice what is happening. Uh, he's talking about the spans of creation and when he's quoting. He says, for do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Here's, here's the idea. Uh, who will say, or do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, who will keep the laws in such a way that I can become equal with God? Who can say in their heart that I'm going to be so moral that I can get to God's plane? Who dare say that? There are people who say that. And it results in hubris and arrogance. Or worse yet, it results in, in complete and abject failure when you can't do it and you think you don't measure up. That was the story of Martin Luther. Uh, you remember that story? He, he, was, so, he was so consumed with, uh, with this keeping of the law in his life that uh, because he felt something was missing in his heart, he felt it. And he, he felt like the best way he could get what he was missing in his heart was by keeping the law of Christ and keeping the law of, uh, of the biblical mandates. And, and so he would go about and he was so rigorous in his spiritual duties. In fact, there's, the, the reality is, is it probably some of his early abuses upon his body, he would flagellate himself, right? And he would starve himself um, with fasting just to try to prove his worth to God, to ascend to the level of God. And, and some of those abuses upon his body probably uh, took his life uh, later when he got sick, were the cause of his sickness later that eventually claimed him. And, and it wasn't until Martin Luther discovered that grace in, from Jesus Christ comes by faith did he find something profoundly new in his life. You see, um, see, this is what happened, is he had tried, he had tried to ascend. And who will say in their heart, who can ascend to where God is? Here's the amazing thing, is what it says in here, is that God came down to us. Because we couldn't. We couldn't. And he knew that, so he came down to us. But then the other one is, is, is the next one. Um, he says... Um, uh, who will descend into the abyss, that is to say, to bring Christ up from the dead. Um, how low do you need to go? 
<laughs> right? Um, how far do you need to get before God can be present in your life? Um, it, it's this idea that, that morality does not make us like God, the ascension portion, nor does a lack of righteousness make us unworthy of God. Because guess what? We're all, we're all lacking righteousness. So he, he's saying, no matter where you go, but here's the amazing thing, and he ties this in with Christ. He says, Christ who started on high came to humanity and then he died, goes into the abyss. And then he was raised again to new humanity and now is ascended on high. You see, Paul is giving us this continuum and it's like those, those uh, magnets on wheels you roll over your driveway after your kids have finished a project using screws and nails, right? You understand, you've seen those things, long bar, Strong magnet on there, you wheel it around and it picks up all this stuff. So here's what happens. Christ kind of works this way. He starts on high. He's God. He's God in form and in being and in person. He's God. And he descends to earth and he, he spends his life, womb to tomb, he spends his life among God's people. But like one of those magnets, he's attracting not just people to him, but he's, he's picking up all of the things that make us human. All of the sin, all of the crud. Remember, he was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrow, right? We looked upon him with shame because he had accumulated all of these bits of humanity. It didn't, it didn't detract from the fact that he was God, but like that magnet, he just he went around and he accumulated all of these things upon himself and then finally it crushed him to death. It crushed him, that weight of who we are. Uh, Second Thessalonians tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us. So that, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians says that, that he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin. It crushed him to death and he took it with him into the grave so that all those things were dead and it lay in the grave. But when he was raised, he was raised with that stuff still in the grave. You see, this is his ministry. And he ascended back into heaven, now as true human and true God, true Israel, true man, and true God, sitting on, sitting on one throne, ruling the universe. Did you know right now there is a human running the universe? A human, Jesus. He's still very human. He still has scars in his hands, but he's ne he never stopped being God. But right now, a human is running the universe. This is the place that God had given Adam and Eve from the beginning. And Jesus is doing it on behalf of Adam. And he did it as the Messiah, as the true Israel. He did all of this and he left all of that crud in the grave. He raised again. He seated on the throne and the true human is now interceding for all of humanity. And so Paul is saying, what Paul is saying is that, that this sense of morality is not going to make you, take you up to God, and, and a lack of morality is not going to leave you desolate in the grave. Christ did all of that. Christ did it all. And this he, he did because of righteousness. Righteousness, remember? Relationship. Relationship. Now, is the law met in Christ? Did God ever for a minute forget the law? He didn't, but it was met in Christ. But, but rather than saying the law demands this of you, that you die, instead he said the law demands this of you, instead I'll die. And I'm going to take it with me. So the law is met, the moral code is met, but it's met in Jesus and it's done in a righteous way that preserves the relationship. Covenant faithfulness. Did you know, and get this, all of this to make this big point, did you know God will do anything to win you to himself. He will do anything to win you to himself. Let me rephrase it. Do you know God has done everything to win you to himself? He's already done the work. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, quit, uh, quit legalizing love. Quit, uh, quit making the illegitimate children of love by making it a pure morality. He says, you, you're alienating relationship when you do that. So, so here is the, a major point that we draw out of this. We see it in verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Here's what it says, that Jesus has already spanned the entirety of life and death from the highest heights to the lowest hell and has claimed all things as his. You see, 
It all belongs to him. So therefore, whatever we have is given to us by grace. Grace is God's gift. So what Paul is talking about is this concept of grace by faith. Now, here's another thing we've done with grace. We've made grace just an act of salvation. Saving grace. And, and we get saved and, well, glad I had grace to be saved. But did you know grace is all of God being poured out upon all of you all of the time? Everything from God is grace. So when we say grace by faith, what we're saying is everything for life, everything for salvation, everything for faith, everything is from God. Everything. And it's all by grace. Anything apart from that is, co- is contractual righteousness. It's morality or immorality and nothing more. Grace by faith has everything to do with covenant faithfulness, has everything to do with covenantal righteousness. It has everything to do with everything in who we are. So you need to understand that. That's major point number one. Major point number two is that grace by faith is not grace apart from participation. Right? We get everything from God. It's all His. Just like, and I have to remind my kids of this sometimes, they claim property in my home. Well, it's my room. (laughs) No, it's not. Well, it's my stuff. No, no. Um, Well, it's, it's, it's my rights. It's my whatever. No, it's really not. It's all mine. All mine. It's all mine. It's all mine. But I've given by grace these things to you for life and living and, 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 and for ages and stages and for development, the right gift at the right time for the right season in life, all of these things to help mature you, right? It, it all comes from one source, but there's this participation in it. So I can give it to my kid, but does my kid need to take it? Well, they better. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, uh, right, I can, give, I can give them a gift, but, but they don't, they've got to participate in that gift. They've got to share in that. It doesn't mean that, it makes, that they made the gift themselves. It doesn't mean that they provided it. It doesn't mean that they caused it. It doesn't mean that they did anything to merit the, the, the gift. It simply means that, that they've got to participate in receiving it. And participating in receiving it means using it and doing something with it for its intended purposes. And this is what Paul is talking about. Sometimes we talk about grace because it all comes from God as if we have no part in it at all. And that's wrong. That is wrong. That is wrong. Sometimes we will we'll preach things that, that imply that, that because grace is by faith and it comes from God and only God and we, we share, have no part in it, that sometimes God gives grace to a few and not to others. That's wrong. It's dead wrong. Remember, we repeated it. We, re- we read it. We repeated it. It is God's desire that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not some. Everyone, everyone. Um, John tells us this in his epistle, that God wants all to be saved. And we don't need to know much Greek to know when all means all. And in this instance, it means all. That is God's desire. God's grace is not poured out on some to the neglect of others. We call that double predestination. And it's just wrong that God elects some to salvation and by electing only a few has elected others to eternal damnation. And that's wrong. It's just wrong. Scripture is very clear on this point. So there is participation in this, but the gift is from God. Grace is from God, and it's grace given to us for the sake of relationship. It's covenant righteousness. Um, Again, I want you to think about the relationships in your life. Do the relationships in your life reflect the covenant righteousness that God has given by grace to you? Because if you're righteous by Christ then your relationships should be covenantal as well. 
And so this idea is that we've got to participate it. And in the same sense, we share in this mission with Christ, this mission of reconciliation, this mission of sharing with the world. It is grace by faith, and it is not grace apart from participation. And, and we do have a participation in this. In verse 10, he tells us what that is, to believe right? For, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We believe and we confess. Did you notice they go together? It's not believe or confess. It's not just believe. Neither is it just confess. It's believe and confess. Like something in our heart matches the things in our hands. And the things in our hands matches what's in our heart. Did you know your beliefs will be betrayed by your actions? <laughs> what you truly believe in will be evidenced in what you do. The things that you do continually, that's where your core belief is. I've been having this problem of late. No one wants to hear me talk about this, and I understand it, but I've, I've been having this problem where something is forming right in here, and it's scary to me. And I believe I should be able to get this thing gone. And I don't need it to be gone, but at least not doing the things that it does, right? It's just a little more, I, I don't need washboards, I don't need like a six pack, I mean eight will do, um, <laughs> right? I, but I, Chris Hemsworth, you know, he, he learned from me. Um, I don't need all that, but, but something, and, and it's not, it's not the, the, the problem of things right now, it's me predicting the future, right? <laughs> Okay, so I've got this problem, and I have this belief I can do something about this. Um, so instead, I just took water pills <laughs> um, and thought that would help. It, it just didn't. So I thought, I can do something about this, right? I can do some sit-ups or burpees or whatever, Ugh, right? I can do something about it, but instead what I've been doing, because I believe I can do something about this, but instead what I've been doing is going at about 9 o'clock and standing in front of the Shekinah glory of the open refrigerator. <laughs> and, and slicing some cheese and eating some Triscuits and some saltines and a little hot sauce. And, then, and it's weird. I'm at the stage in my life where like, the more I eat, the hungrier I get. What has happened? What has happened? Um, and so I've got this belief. I've got this belief in my head that I can do something about this, but my practice actually betrays my real belief. You see how that works? We can say one thing, but when our actions are doing something else, it actually betrays what we really believe. And so here's this idea of belief. It's belief goes with action. Action goes with belief. So we get frustrated at this point, don't we? Because I, I don't know about you, but I can't just believe. There are people who can just believe. I'm not one of them. I need proof. It needs to be testable. I need to be, I need to be able to experience it, right? I, 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 my brain has to be engaged in this. I, need, I, I, I was an atheist for many years. I needed proof. Proof. I, I don't just believe. And even now, I cannot just believe. Some of you have the, a gift of faith that I, I lack. But I can't make myself believe. And, and you can say, well, what's your problem? It, regardless of what my problem is, here's the reality. If I don't believe it, I can't say to myself, well, you just believe it. I can't do that. But what I can do is I can form habits. I can form habits that change my belief. You're like, well, then how do you believe? Do, do the habits change your belief or does the belief change the habits? And sometimes I think we treat this as an either or. We call it faith, belief, and we call it works. Faith and works, faith and works. And we're like, Paul says never to do any works. That's bad. No, it's not. We've been saved for good works, he says in Ephesians. We've been saved for, for good works. So we're like, works are bad. Don't do good works. Well, no, that's stupid. Do good works. But don't do good works and think it's going to make you ascend to heaven. Ah, right? And you're like, oh, this is so hard. So then, do I do good works so I believe, or do I need to believe first before I do good works? But I don't believe to do good works because I can't believe. I can't make myself believe 
to do. Do you see the problem? Maybe it's just my problem. Is it my problem? Has anyone else ever lived in this moment where you feel like a dog chasing their tail? And we feel like it's one or the other, faith or works, faith or works, faith or works. And the preacher will get up and hammer works one Sunday and faith another Sunday. And you're like, what am I supposed to do? So we're going to bring all of this together in a word picture that has helped me. Because I don't think it's an either or. I think, think it's a both and. 